Say to everybody out there listening and or watching, we appreciate it as always. Apple Pod, Spotify, and YouTube. Leave those comments. Give us those thumbs up. They mean an awful lot. Let's start with some Patriots news here quickly. The IR returnees to practice yesterday. We had Reef. We had Flowers. We had Davis back at practice. No sign of Tyquan Thornton. No sign of Jack Jones. Keep an eye on that the rest of the week. Uh, Riley Reef, look, I, I, I was hoping we would not get to this point, but I think we're at this point. Reef might be able to actually help you at right tackle if the guy is healthy. He, he might be able to help you out. No promises. But the way the right tackle spot has been this year, it says an awful lot when we look at Riley Reef and, and say to ourselves, wondering, is he the answer? <laughs> is Riley Reef the answer? Uh, Trey Flowers, I, I think Flowers is a little bit more – of a significant move now that Matthew Judon is out for likely the season. He's another body. He's another guy that knows the system that you can put out there, play on the defensive line. He has some versatility. So Flowers might actually get some snaps. I hope it does not get in the way of Keon White's development, which we talked about a little bit uh, over the last couple of days. Tyquan Thornton, look, if he gets out there, he could help. And I'm not telling you he's going to catch five, six, seven footballs a week. I'm not telling you he's going to give you massive production, but just his speed, the verticality that he brings to this offense, the speed element that they're missing, especially the speed element that they miss when they only play Pop Douglas 18 snaps in a game like last weekend. So Taekwon, his verticality, his ability to get upfield will theoretically allow the underneath to develop a little bit more. The intermediate, the middle of the field, all of those kinds of routes should be easier to get guys open if you have Thornton, the speedster, stretching that field out, bringing that verticality. And and look, Jack Jones, we'll see what happens with him. Now, they can easily bring these guys back whenever they want, so it's not necessarily meaning that they're done for the year. But uh, Jack Jones, well, they, they got to bring him back within a certain window. But just because they're not back this week doesn't mean they won't be back today, tomorrow, or next week. But Jack Jones, the J.C. Jackson trade, I mentioned this yesterday, some Jack Jones insurance. And maybe you don't feel like you have to rush Jack Jones back or even Jonathan Jones back because you bring in Jackson. That might be putting too much on Jackson, but just from a body standpoint, you might feel less urgency bringing one of those two guys back now that you have J.C. and somebody who, again, knows the scheme and should be able to fit in, even if he's 80% of what he was going back a few years ago with the Patriots, he's still an upgrade over Sean Wade. He's likely an upgrade over Miles Bryant, and he's probably an upgrade on the outside over Jalen Mills, even at 80%. So we'll see how all of that unfolds. Like, rate, review, subscribe. Uh, We've had some great numbers this week. The community is jumping, it's popping, and that's because of you. Every single one of you that listen, that watch, that go to YouTube and give us that thumbs up, give us the comments, let us know how you're feeling about what I have to say. Um, I I love going back and forth with you guys in the comments. So the more likes, the more comments, the more eyeballs, and this brand will continue to grow. Thanks because of you. It's all about you guys and gals that are watching and listening. All right, let's get into uh, Mac Jones, because I, I think when we look at Sunday's game, this could be the most important game of Mac Jones's career. It feels like whether right or wrong, all eyes are on Mac after that game in Dallas. And I think it's justified to have at least most eyeballs on Mac because of what we saw. He was shook, inexcusable decision-making. He was terrible on Sunday. And now everybody, including myself, we're going to be watching carefully to see if Mac is scared, if he's seeing ghosts, if he's making terrible decisions, if he's not actually seeing the field with his eyes like he usually does. So everybody will be watching Mac on Sunday. Rex Ryan will be watching Mac on Sunday because he can't wait to sit there and tell you how terrible Mac Jones is. Even though last Sunday on the pregame show, he told everybody that Zach Wilson wasn't the reason why the Jets lost to the Patriots in week three. Try to fit your head around that. Yeah, makes no sense. So the haters, the anti-Mac crowd, even the crowd that is kind of wishy-washy on Mac, they're, they're not necessarily done with him, but they're not buying in. They're all going to be at the ready. They're all going to be waiting and waiting to see what happens on Sunday against the Saints. So inevitably, the question is, will Mac be able to face that adversity, overcome the adversity, and play better than he played on Sunday? And is playing better 
even good enough? Does he have to play much better? We'll get into that. But let's talk about adversity. Let's talk about how Mac Jones can respond to adversity. I argue that Mac has had adversity all season long with the circumstances that he's been dealing with. And that's not to excuse the bad decision-making. It's not to excuse last Sunday. He's just had to face adversity because of the Patriots' offense. Let me give you some numbers because I think this will really put into perspective how bad things have been. Let's, let's take quarterback play out of it, okay? Whether you hate, love, like, whatever. Mac Jones, let's take him out of the equation and let's just look at Let's just look at this offense. This offense is 32nd in the league in pass protection. Now I'm using, again, that composite pass protection ranking, which I love. It takes SIS, ESPN, PFF, all the acronyms. It takes those three acronyms, and they put those numbers together, and they tell you a composite score pretty much of the offensive line and the pass protection. They do this for run blocking as well. And the pass pro for the Patriots, the worst in the league. 32nd, the worst pass protection in football through the first month. Run game, the Patriots are 28th in the league in yards per carry, bottom five. So worst O-line pass protection, bottom five run game. They're 24th, thanks to Evan Lazar for this number, 24th in the NFL on early down offense, which means first and second downs, they have not been doing a good enough job. 24th in the league on first and second down. And that is lack of run game. That is lack of protection. That is bad penalties on the offensive line. A mixture of those things. Their top pass catcher, when you look at receptions in the league right now, their top pass catcher, before we start uh, week five tonight, their top pass catcher, 43rd in receptions, that's Hunter Henry. Their top wide receiver regarding receptions in the league, 53rd, that's Kendrick Bourne. You have the third offensive coordinator in three years. The second of those three offensive coordinators is not even an offensive coordinator. He's not even an offensive coach. And two of the four games they've played have been against two of the best defenses in football, Dallas and the Jets. So I think Mack has been facing adversity from week one, from the jump. Worst O-line in the game when pass protection is brought up. Bottom five run game. Bottom five receiver core. Third offensive coordinator in three years. Bad early down offense. And in two of the four games, you played against two of the best defenses in the league. Now, last week, again, it was inexcusable. Inexcusable, he was awful, games on him. But I ask you the question, how many quarterbacks could actually play well with the numbers I just gave you? How many quarterbacks? It doesn't matter if it's Mac or somebody else. Just, just put quarterback X in the pocket. How many are playing Good football with the worst pass protection in the league. Bottom five run game. Bottom five receiving core. The answer, to me, it's it's Patrick Mahomes and maybe Josh Allen. Frankly, Mac Jones has had the worst offensive situation in football through the first month. The worst offensive situation. ESPN's Dan Orlovsky, he put it very well earlier today on X. The quarterback position is a dependent position. This idea that the quarterback is supposed to make everybody great around him is a myth. The truly greats can do that. The Tom Brady's can do that. And that's why Patriots fans and some of the pundits, they have been conditioned because Brady was almost always able to get more out of his talent. Now, that doesn't mean that every quarterback does that. They don't. The vast majority is incapable of doing so. That's a fact. So I'd say he's faced adversity already, but let's look at this because the question is, are we going to see what we saw on Sunday? Was that regression? Was that regression that we can expect to continue from Mac? Was that the beginning of the end for Mac? The short circuiting that we witnessed against the Cowboys, is that going to be what he is now? Or are we going to chalk it up to a bad game? and just say he was terrible against Dallas. It is what it is. I'll give you some hope. I'm going to give you some hope, okay? Now, Mac Jones, when you look back at his two worst games prior to this year, what I did was I looked back to 2021, his rookie season, and 2022, and I found the two worst games of that, of that particular season, okay? 
So I looked at those games, and then I looked at how Mac responded the next week. Here's what I found out. Mac Jones in 2021, the worst game of his rookie season was week 16 against the Buffalo Bills. That game was actually at Gillette Stadium. In that game, Mac Jones was 14 of 32 for a buck 45, zero touchdowns and two interceptions. As a matter of fact, Mac Jones's passer rating in week 16 of his rookie year against the Buffalo Bills at Gillette Stadium was actually worse than his passer rating last week against Dallas. That's how bad that game was. So how did Mac respond? Mac came back week 17 against the Jaguars. He threw 22 of 30, 227 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Mac had the second best passer rating of his rookie season the very week following the worst performance of his rookie season. He went from the worst performance to the second best performance of his rookie year. Keep that in mind. How about last year in 2022? Well, if you look at it, Mac's worst game last year was that game against the Raiders. We all remember that game because of the Jacoby Myers, Ramondre Stevenson brain fart. What a terrible way to end a game. We all remember that game because of Myers and Stevenson. But in reality, that was Mac's worst game last year. Mac against the Raiders. He was 13 of 31, 112 yards. No touchdowns, no interceptions. His passer rating was a 52.1. That was his la- his, his worst game last season. So how did he respond? Did he respond like he responded in 2021? Did he follow up his worst game of the year with one of his best? Well, week 16 at home, Gillette Stadium against Cincinnati. 21 of 33, 240 yards, two touchdowns. Zero interceptions. His passer rating was 105.6, which was, you guessed it, the second best passer rating of the season last year for Mac. So in 2021, Mac had his worst game of the year, followed that up with his second best game of the year. In 2022, Mac had his worst game of the year, followed that up with the second best game of his season. That's been the trend. Now, yes, opponent plays a role, the tone of the game, the trends, all of those things, they play a role. But all I can tell you is when Mac has looked his worst the last two years, when he has looked his absolute worst, he has come back and given you some of his best games as a Patriots quarterback. Fact, not opinion. 100% fact what I just gave you. Nobody can deny that or debate it. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't in most instances. What else did I learn from this? Well, you know, Mac, when you look at the two games post-worst games, he completed 68% of his passes, five touchdowns, no interceptions. In the two games following the two worst games of his career, he has a passer rating of 116.85. It's outrageous. What else did I learn? Well, Mac is pretty much good for two suck games per year. So what you saw in Dallas, if we go by what Mac has done in the past, his first two years in the league, he's had two suck games. He has been terrible, atrocious, two games per year. So hopefully he got one of the two out of the way last week against the Cowboys. And I ask you, has the narrative ever changed? Of course not, because as soon as Mac has a game like last week, everybody freaks out. Panic happens. I'm not telling you he's not going to stink this weekend. I'll have more on that in a minute. But what I'm telling you is all the people that were freaking out, I bet you they were probably freaking out in 2021 after that game against Buffalo. They were freaking out last year after that game against the Raiders. And what Mac did was he responded both times. But we don't remember the response. We remember the meltdown. We remember what's worse. It's like a human condition. Mac Jones has undoubtedly played better football, much better football, following a terrible performance in his Patriots career. Will he do it again on Sunday? That's the biggest question. Now, if he falls on his face again, 
I think the Zappy crowd is going to grow louder. I, I don't think Bailey Zappy would do any better than Mac has done, given the circumstances. I think Bailey would do worse, given the circumstances. But the Zappy crowd is going to get louder, and I understand it. If he falls on his face again, it's reasonable to look around and say, hey, man, can Bailey do better? Can Will Greer do better? Because this is just awful. That's if he falls on his face. You'll have the Bailey crowd. Of course, Belichick is coaching for his future if this continues to sputter. So he's going to have some pressure and, and urgency at that position. Inevitably, the question is this Sunday, you know, can Mac bounce back? Can he bounce back? And, and what are reasonable expectations? Because I'm here to tell you, you best temper your expectations. I'm somebody who's still giving Mac Jones a chance here. I'm somebody who still believes you can win with him, not because of him. I still believe he's a guy that can do the right things if he has the right circumstances surrounding him, which has always been the case since he was drafted out of Alabama. But I am here to tell you, do not expect Mac Jones to put up big numbers on Sunday against the Saints. If you're expecting Mac Jones to light up the world, those are unreasonable expectations. And I'll tell you why. It's something we've talked about a lot on this podcast. It's called man coverage. Mac Jones against man coverage. Bottom five in completion percentage, yards per attempt, EPA per drop back, in passer rating. He's bottom five in all of those categories against man coverage. And we've told you why that is. If you want to check it out, go back to prior pods. It has to do with receivers and all of that stuff. Here's the thing. The Saints defense uses man coverage. The fifth most in the NFL. So Mac in this offense has been dreadful against man coverage. As a matter of fact, this offense has been dreadful against man coverage going back to Tom Brady in 2019. It's been a running problem. Terrible against man. The Saints play the fifth most man coverage in the league. And here's the thing. They don't just play man a lot. They play it really well. Taylor Kyles does a great job. You guys want to check him out on uh, X, CLNS. He had some stats this week. I'm not going to sit there and give you all the numbers. I'll just tell you, the Saints are a top five man defense in the league. So they play at the fifth most and they are top five when it comes to all of the statistics that you want to look at as far as being a successful man defense. So I would not expect big numbers from Mac. I think that's unreasonable. But what we should expect from Mac is for him to not look like he looked on Sunday against the Cowboys. It's going to be more of an eye test. It's going to be the little things. Is he losing his mind in the pocket? Are his eyes there? Is he missing wide open receivers, right? Is he making the right play? Is he trying to do too much? Does he turn the football over? Why did he turn the football over? So all of those things, his footwork in the pocket. I'm not looking for big numbers because of this matchup and because of what we've learned. Big numbers would be great. But history is the best indicator, and history tells me that man coverage has stalled this offense out time and time and time again. So if we go into Sunday thinking Mac's going to throw for 303 touchdowns, forget about it. It's not going to be a numbers day. We're looking for habits and decisions. That's the most important thing. If his habits improve and his decision-making improves, then you feel better about it. Like, rate, review, subscribe. Don't forget Apple Pods. We also are on Spotify, YouTube. The likes, the comments mean so much. If you're watching this, listening to it on YouTube, and you like what you're listening and watching, then just take one second out of your day, one second out of your day, and click that thumbs up. It means a ton to us. More eyeballs. All right, Bill O'Brien, how much is on him? I just gave you all the offensive numbers and the max stuff. How much is on Bill O'Brien? He's not blameless. Lack of creativity. I think a lack of urgency within his play calling. Uh, they're not running out of power look schemes, which just drives me crazy. Um, they're not running the football as much with, with power looks as they have in the past. They've been doing a lot of different things. Um, you know, shotgun runs, runs out of the RPOs, all those different kinds of elements. But they, they've stopped running downhill between tackles, old school Patriots run game. And this is, you know, when you look at Stevenson and Zeke Elliott, those two guys are tailor-made for that kind of run game. 
Bill O'Brien called two screens against Dallas. Now I know going back a couple weeks ago, we said, man, he, he called like 14 or 15 screens. Relax with the screens. There's a balance. There's a gray area. You don't have to throw 15 screens a game because it, it becomes entirely predictable. However, against the defense and against that pass rush and what Dallas was doing, you should have called for more than two screens. So that needed to be better. There's been a lack of play action throughout the year. I mean, Max hovering around, I think, 17% play action calls. That's a big dip from last year. And when you look at Max numbers, Mac is literally a top five or six quarterback this year out of the play action. And they have not been calling play action. Some of that's O-line, some of that's lack of run game, but you still have to be more committed to play action. But the Matt Patricia stuff is outrageous. And I know some people will love to throw numbers out there and say, well, you know, the offense, again, men lie, women lie, numbers don't in most instances. When we look at the Matt Patricia offense last year and the numbers, because everybody, oh, look, they're, they're averaging X amount of points per game, and they averaged this amount of points per game last year through the first four weeks. What that lacks is what we bring here on the Nick Cattle Show. What that lacks is context. Context matters. And so when you look at the context, this offensive line is a debacle. I gave you the composite pass pro rating earlier, right? They're 32nd in the league. They're dead last in pass protection. But Greg Bedard actually posted this on X earlier in the week. The offensive line stats, they're hideous. Eight sacks, 20 hits, 40 hurries, 68 pressures. The pressure rate is over 41%, which is outrageously bad. Stuffed runs, 37 stuffed runs, which means one yard or less on a run attempt. That's 35%. 35% of this team's rushing attempts have been stuffed. I don't think it can get worse. If you're wondering how this offensive line compares to the past two years, because that's a game we play. This year's pressure rate, again, 41.2%. Last year was 22%. Scratch that, it was 27%. I need better eyes. So this year, 41.2% pressure rate. Last year was 27%. Run stuff rate. This year, 35%. Last year, 28%. That play action rate, 17%. It was the same last year, and we know that was a big, big, big criticism, and it should have been the lack of play action. Same percentage of play action called this year than last year. Not setting your quarterback up to succeed. If you're wondering, back in 2021, in Max rookie season, 27%. So if you look at Max rookie year and you look at this year, play action rate, 10% higher. So I meant, la I meant his rookie season versus this year, not last year's play action rate versus this year. But when you look at his rookie season, 27% play action rate this year, 17%. When you look at run stuff rate, his rookie season, 27% this year, 35%. When you look at pressure rate, his rookie season, 31%. This year, 41.2%. You get the point. Context matters. This offensive line has been a debacle compared to last year. And last year, it wasn't very good. Ramondre Stevenson hasn't been the same guy this year. And that's not just because of play calling. His rushing yards over expectation has been way in the minus. He's been one of the worst running backs in the league when it comes to rushing yards over expectation. So what you are expected to get on a certain run, Stevenson has consistently fallen short of that all year. So you don't have the same Ramondre Stevenson. You got rid of Jacoby Myers and replaced him with Juju Smith-Schuster. Enough said on that. Your strength of schedule last year was 10th overall. This year, you've played against Philadelphia, the Jets, Dallas, Miami. Now, obviously, the Jets, not a very good football team right now, but that's because of their offense for the most part. Their defense has been good. What their defense do against Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes this year, right? So the strength of schedule has been brutal through the first month. You can't compare Matt Patricia and Bill O'Brien and just say, well, these are the numbers. It's set. This offense is the same. Bill O'Brien's not much better than Matt Patricia. And I don't even want to get into the spacing and the scheme stuff and all of that. Bill O'Brien can absolutely be better. Is Bill O'Brien much better than Matt Patricia? Of course he is. Let's give context to the conversation. Like, rate, review, and subscribe. Again, great numbers this week because of those thumbs being up. And YouTube and the comments go back and forth with yours truly. I always love going back and forth with you guys. I'm trying to figure out how to react to the Spotify comments. I'm having a tough time with that. I see your comments on Spotify. 
I just haven't figured out how to actually react and respond to those. I'll get to that. Uh, Apple Pods as well. So Apple Pods, Spotify, and YouTube, Nick Cattle Show, Monday through Friday, about 30 minutes a day, give you the latest on Boston sports. If you're new to the program, welcome aboard. Jump on in. Water is warm. Let's go to the Celtics here for a couple of minutes because I thought Wick Grosbeck during Drew Holiday's press conference, which, man, oh, man, did you see Brian, Brad Stevens smiling? Hey, everybody. That dude was. I've never seen Brad Stevens that happy. I don't know if Brad Stevens was that happy during the birth of his child. I don't know if Brad Stevens was that happy during his wedding day. Brad Stevens was ecstatic during that press conference yesterday. But during the Drew Holiday uh, press conference, and again, Cattle's on Causeway every Wednesday, Celtics podcast that I'm doing, exclusive Celtics content. We really dug deep into Drew Holiday and how he can help this team yesterday. Check it out, Cattle's on Causeway, same YouTube channel. But uh, I thought Wick Grosbeck said something very interesting. He brought up six years. He mentioned that there was a six-year window. Six-year window and that they were going to be aggressive. Now, why was it six years? That was my first question. Like, why is it six? Jason Tatum in six years will be 31. Jalen Brown, of course, will be 32. Is that is that kind of what he's looking towards? Once those guys get in their 30s, we might have to take a step back here. Does that tell us that Wick Grosbeck and this franchise are actually planning on keeping Tatum and Brown for the next six years? That they're going to actually keep both guys making over $100 million annually for the next six years? Both their max guys? Is that the plan? Is that why he said six years? Is Wick Grosbeck selling the team in 2030? (laughs) Is that why he said six years? Is it because this is Brad Stevens' window? Has Brad communicated to Wick saying, you know, I'm done after Jason's next max contract is up? Or somewhere around there? Or or has Stevens told Wick Grosbeck, I'm done by 2030. I don't want to do this job, you know, in 2030. Is that that why the the window is, is six years? So it was, it was, I was curious as to why Wick said six years. I would also say this. It's great news for Celtics fans because your owner went out there and publicly said, we're going to keep pushing this thing. We're going to keep pushing for the next six years. I also wonder, you know, if you win a championship this year, if you win a championship next year, if you win a championship at any point over the next six years before you hit that six-year mark, does that mean things are going to change? Lots of questions out of that one comment. I took it as a very positive comment. When your owner says we got a six-year window, we're going to keep on spending. We're going to do what it takes. We're going to we're going to do everything, you know, short of dying for for Banner eighteen. That's great to hear from an owner, especially when we've seen some of the other ownership groups over the over the last several years with their respective clubs. Right? Great to hear. And Wick also said that publicly. He set the expectations. The expectation is now set. You went out and publicly said, we are going to do anything that we can do, everything that we could do for the next six years to make this team a championship team. So now people should walk into this with the expectation that they're going to continue to spend at a very, very high level. Wick publicly said it. He opened the door because if they fall short in future years, That comment is going to come back, and it should come back, and he should be asked about it. Wait a minute. You said it was a six-year window. Wait a minute. You said you were going to spend. This is year three of the six-year window. He wasn't clear to me whether or not it was six years for a championship or if it was six years. Let's win multiple championships. Wasn't really clear. Will they keep going after Banner 18 if they do get Banner 18? But a very fascinating comment from the owner. All right, let's wrap it up with some quick Bruins notes. Yes, I said Bruins. Got to get Beast talk in here. Got to talk about Matthew Patra. A 19-year-old prospect, and throughout this preseason, he's been good. Last preseason game is tonight, of course, before they drop the puck for real next week. He had a fantastic assist uh, on the geeky goal on Monday. Uh, He had a terrific Go find it on X. A terrific game-tying goal on Tuesday night. 
My word. My word, what a play by Patra on Tuesday night. Uh, and, and practice, centering a, a Marshan, a Frederick line. He's been thrown together with, with Marshan. There's some thought maybe that he could actually be the center on the second line and you drop Coyle back to the third line. There has been some of that scuttlebutt going on. Uh, Patra has great feel, high IQ. He has shown tremendous poise. He has just been a playmaker. Playmaker, mostly for others, but again, on Tuesday night, that game tying goal, he showed that he can be a playmaker individually on his own and finish around the net, which was nice to see. So there's a lot of excitement. Second round pick in 2022. So he has somewhat of that pedigree. And uh, here's the deal he can play nine games with the Bruins before he burns a year of his entry level deal. He's not going to go down to Providence. But he he has to have, you know, if he plays more than nine games with the Bs, that entry-level contract is donezo. So does he start the year? I, I think he's going to start the year on the team. He he deserves to start the year on the team. Give him the first nine games and see how he plays. The first nine games, if he's playing at that kind of level, if he's showing you, if he is capable of being the number two center on this team, if he's on that second line and not falling ass over tea kettle, embarrassing himself through nine games, then... I, you, you should be excited. He's 19 years old. Now, the one thing, question, big question for me is he's 176 pounds. You know, is he going to be able to hold up defensively on that end of the ice like the Bruins ask their centers to? Is he going to be able to do that at 176? The wear and tear and physicality of the league. 176 is not a very big dude. So that's a big question. I don't know, maybe give him some protein shakes. Give him like 20 protein shakes a day. Give him a bunch of carbs. I, I don't know. But can he hold up defensively with that lack of size? So uh, that, that's that that's been a great, great thing out of this B's preseason is uh, Matthew Potra showing up and playing well. And I, I think he's earned a spot. He's earned a spot in that dressing room to start this year. 100%. I think he'll be on the team. Another young guy, uh, Mason Lorai, he's also been playing pretty well. Killed a penalty uh, in the third period on Tuesday night. It was out there on the PK. So if you're wondering, two guys that have shown up, two young guys that have shown up, giving you some, giving you some good feels, Patra and Lorai have been two guys that have done that. All right, that'll do it for today's pod and uh, show. Thanks for joining me as always. Apple, Pods, Spotify, YouTube. Give that thumbs up. More eyeballs. Throw in some comments, whether you agree or disagree with me. I love to see what you guys think. Uh, so keep that going. We'll be back tomorrow to dive into this Saints-Patriots matchup on Sunday. I don't think it's going to be the most aesthetically pleasing game. That's a hint, but we'll get into it tomorrow. Until then, be well.